Hi, everybody. Welcome to the EMS Today Show. I'm AJ Heitman. I'm your host. I'm the editor emeritus of GEMS. And uh, I think it's appropriate that I talk about being an editor emeritus with my background and my experience because I have um, a bunch of people with me today, five people that uh, I hate to total up with the experiences. They're all in the 30 plus year club, uh, except for Dr. Peter Pons. He's, uh, he's in the 40 plus club, so uh, <laughs> we'll call that out. And uh, spiritually with us and, uh, and really the, the person behind what we're going to talk about today is Norm McSwain, who uh, was really kind of, I won't say a mentor to me, he was a, a, a colleague, but uh, anybody who knows trauma care and does not know Norm McSwain uh, better read this book. Um, we're going to talk about, and, and, and I like to do on the EMS Today Show, invite people that have something that's really cool and innovative and uh, and, and when I talked to Will Chaplo about this uh, new book, uh, I, I, I just, I had to get my hands on it. And when I took a look at it, I thought, God, this is, you know, where's this been my whole career? <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about the book in a minute, but I wanna uh, first talk about the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute because you do a lot of work for GEMS and you do a lot of work worldwide. So give us a snippet of uh, who the group is. Basically, um, people that are, are familiar with us know that we've been working together on creating educational programs uh, and writing uh, for books for several decades. Uh, we found ourselves in a position to be able to do something different, so we assembled ourselves into the uh, International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute with our overriding philosophy of providing relevant material to providers that was affordable, uh, accessible, and constantly updated. Um, we introduced ourselves to GEMS. Uh, one of our first publications were literature reviews, uh, which we thought, again, would, we'd love to have accessible to the average provider. So we partner with GEMS so that these reviews are posted monthly um, in both places, at our, at, on our pages and also at GEMS. And, and that's become very popular. And then uh, uh, this, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Dr. Pons in a second about the book. The book is, is titled Pre-Hospital Medicine, Principles, Pearls, and Pitfalls. Um, it's self-published. It's an amazing book. Um, don't get scared when I tell you this, folks. It's 86, <laughs> easy to read chapters. Um, they're very concise. They're, they're exceptionally well written. 737 pages. So if nothing else, if you have a patient who attacks you, you can beat them back with this book. And uh, there's 33 contributing authors. It's, uh, it's a massive book. And uh, I started, a, you can see I, I put yellow stickies on things that I began to like. And then I called Will and I said, I love everything that I like. We got to do a show about it. Um, I grew up with a couple books in my collection that were little small, little thumb through, through books. And a lot of people that the action guide for emergency medical services or for emergency service personnel by Harvey Grant was one that, you know, is, uh, is one of my favorites. If I want to, I was at an accident scene and I needed to figure out how much dirt was on somebody when the when the spoil uh, crushed them underneath? I could tell anybody who's there excavating exactly how much weight is on top of that person. So it's kind of one of those weird things. And and when I started to look through the book, it's uh, it's written in such a way that it's it's very conversational. Now, now let me let me talk about the people that are on with us today. Uh, Will Chipotle, you spoke already, and uh, Will's been a paramedic for 41 years. Uh, he goes back to, I think you were a paramedic for Moses, were you not? And uh, you, you were his, his right hand person. AJ, your sound, yeah. your sound is out. Okay. Okay. You okay? You, you're better now, I think. You, okay. you lost me. You lost me for a second? Yeah. I was saying that you, you used to be a paramedic for Moses, but you didn't laugh, so I knew you didn't hear me. <laughs> Been around for a long time and uh, what was very close friends with Norm McSwain, did a lot of work in the trauma field with Norm McSwain. Uh, and then we have Greg Chapman, who many of you know, most of you probably know, a respiratory therapist and educator. He's been involved since 75, probably about the time that I, I came on the, on the horizon. Uh, Mike Hunter is a veteran of EMS for more than 37 years and served as deputy uh, chief of EMS for Worcestershire uh, EMS in uh, and uh, Peter Pond, who I've known for a long time, uh, you, you, you can't be in the Denver area and not know who Peter Pond is. And 
can't be in the educational field. He's been writing and working and, and lecturing for over 40 years. Uh, Luke Stuckey is a, a trauma surgeon at the Normandy Swain uh, Spirit of Charity Trauma Center at the uh, University Medical Center. And uh, wow, what a, what a privilege to have you on. Uh, what an honor to, to work at a facility named after Norm. And uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about your background too. So I've been a paramedic for quite a few years back into the early 80s. Um, I work for a hospital-based system. We're a urban system, a level one trauma center, stroke center. STEMI Center, um, work with great medical directors. We have an EMS fellowship program. We have our own air medical program. We're all intertwined as well as uh, our own communication center as a secondary PSAP. So pretty well rounded. We just get to do a little bit of everything, get to see a little bit of everything in the pre-hospital uh, format, starting to get into a little bit of MIH stuff. So we're, we're out there, we're doing it and it's, uh, it's fun. We like. I've done this for a long time. And I just can't imagine ever doing anything else. Well, the book uh, actually got its genesis off of another project that Dr. Pons had worked on. Um, so you decided, Dr. Pons, did you not to to take that original work and just expand upon it and bring it out? Exactly. This uh, started out a number of years ago um, as part of another series uh, that uh, was part of the secret series that uh, covered a variety of medical specialties. Uh, we did this one in pre-hospital care, uh, but the publisher's focus really was medical specialties. So it didn't do as well. They returned the copyright back to me. And I thought this was an ideal project for us to update uh, and expand and bring back. Um, and again, the ideal being that we could do it in a way that was cost effective um, and inexpensive for the uh, provider. Well, I think if I was still an operations director, um, which was one of my favorite uh, jobs in my career, I'd probably buy a bunch of these and I'd probably have to sign them out because they'd never come back if, uh, if I didn't sign them out. Uh, because it's really one of those books that I think should be on the shelf of educators, of paramedics. I could be posting in downtown Denver somewhere and, and bring up some facts in here that I'll bet you my partner never even knew. Um, I could spend the entire show just going through the, uh, the chapters, uh, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, there's 86 of them, which is amazing in and of itself. And what I'll tell you um, out there is that there's, there's no fat in this book. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's in a question and answer format, and uh, it's very conversational. It's, it's very understandable. So if you're a student or if you're a 20 year paramedic, I'll guarantee you that you're gonna find something. And I think that was your intent in writing the book, am I correct? Absolutely. And uh, the question and answer format as books go is pretty unique. Um, it gives someone the opportunity to read the question actually formulate an answer even before they read our answer um, and also allows for the sort of conversation that you just mentioned, sitting in an ambulance, posted somewhere, um, you can talk about some of these points. Well, I'm gonna tell you something and, and uh, you know, each of you can tell me maybe one of your favorite uh, pages or one of your favorite sections, but uh, because of COVID and because a lot of my friends are uh, really stressed out at this time, I, I landed on page 155 on the chapter on stress. And uh, it was, uh, what are some of the uh, health problems I might experience caused by it or, or, or exacerbated by stress, which is very important. And then what are some additional signs and symptoms of stress and stress overload? And then you know, what are some of the ways and techniques I can use for managing stress? And when I read that and I thought, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends and I, I, I I focus a lot on stress and suicide and the causative factors. And when I went down here and the, you know, acupuncture, counseling, deep breathing techniques, these are all things that some of the best lectures in the world have pre presented. And what I really liked about this section is that it was right there and it was just like, okay, if you're experiencing these things, relax, here's what you can do. So um, who, who, who do you think 
Uh, maybe Greg, I'll ask you this. Who, who do you think should buy this book? Well, you know, this book is kind of interesting. And um, I think that this book really does the range from the basic new EMT fresh out of school all the way to uh, our emergency residents um, in our medical center when they're doing their EMS rotation. They use this text as sort of a resource, uh, especially ones who have no, no exposure to EMS prior to going to medical school. Um, it really serves a purpose for them. Um, I see it also being used as a great refresher textbook for somebody who's going through a refresher program and needs to stay current um, with, you know, current literature and, you know, what's, what's so important in their everyday work life. Um, that'll be a fantastic benefit to them. Well, and I said to Greg, uh, when we were talking about preparing for the show, when I first opened up and started to read the first chapter, which was the history of EMS, it just hit me like, wow, there's a lot of newbies that really don't know the history of EMS. And not only do you talk about the history of EMS and talk about like some of the first systems in Miami and the other places, but you name the medical directors that were responsible for those systems. So historically, you could sit a student down or you could educate a, a legislator just by having them read that first chapter, which isn't very long, but it's very powerful. And then it goes into what is EMS system design. And a lot of those things may not float the boat of some people, but I just want to pick up for a second and tell you the thing that really got me. You guys self-published this. You guys designed it to be extremely affordable. When you hear that you got a book that's 700 and some pages, I think of the 737 Max, man. This thing is loaded. And uh, it's going to be expensive, but it's not. It's only $14.95 for the ebook, and it's uh, $24.95 for the printed version available. And we'll talk about that. Uh, it's not, I can't, can't emphasize that this is not a plug from me to anybody about the book that you should buy it because there's not a lot of profit here. Uh, what, what's important is if you're in this profession, and you have questions about a pneumothorax or you have questions about doing a crike or pain management, it, it's all in one little shop for you. So Lance, you want, you want to talk about uh, maybe one of your favorite things uh, about this book? So, um, well, I'm, as a trauma surgeon, I'm biased. So my, my favorite chapters are obviously the trauma chapters. And, we but have a lot of them, by the way. It's a lot of them because it, it covers every aspect of trauma from disaster planning, disaster management, all the way up to, you know, every body system that can be injured, uh, head injury, cervical spine injury, abdominal trauma, thoracic trauma, spinal cord injuries. But the, uh, the chapters I had the most fun editing were the, the, the biological chemical warfare chapters because it, it uh, brought me back to my, my, essentially my pre-medical school days of science just you know re refreshing myself as far as the mechanism of action of these different agents and it was fun to go through these chapters and uh and, and go through those those areas of knowledge but but you know m overall my, my favorite chapters are the trauma chapters because that's what i do for a living and that's what i find the most interesting so what was the uh, what was the rationale in the self-publishing and the pricing who wants to take that one well, I'll jump on that a little bit, AJ. You know, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to make an impact on, as Will said before, on the person in the street. Um, we, wanted, we wanted them to be able to get the best quality um, information at, again, an affordable cost. Um, it's interesting. I mean, we've been lucky enough to do courses in that in South America in the past. It's amazing somebody will buy a textbook that is, you know, we think it's $200, $250. And, you know, we go, okay, that's expensive, but that's to be accepted. That's a month's salary for somebody in some of those countries. So we wanted to hit the market and hit it running and be able to do it via a self-publishing format where we can pass the savings on directly to the customer. The other thing the self-publishing format allows us to do is it allows us to do a process that we call dynamic editing. Um, which means, so we're self-published. If something changed tonight in the world of emergency medicine that was so profound that an immediate change had to be made in the way things were taught, 
we can make that change. And by tomorrow afternoon, anybody who bought a new version of the book would have the updated information. You know, no longer would it be waiting for a four year cycle of a publication to expire before a new edition got written. You know, so it's kind of a dynamic work in progress. And that was one of the things that we really truly wanted to do was to make sure that we could do that. And the only way we could do that was by self-publishing. You know, we, we know publishers are constrained by, you know, lots of things because they have, you know, so many inner workings going on, whether it be, you know, a printed textbook coming from China, um, coming on a boat in a container that takes, you know, three months to get here, or just the layup of the graphic artist and so forth. Ours, ours is simple. As I said, you know, this could be changed in a day, um, given the information. I mean, we plan on reviewing the textbook and our course. Um, about once a month or once every two months. And if something is important enough to make that change, we'll go in and make that change immediately. So the information is the most up-to-date there is. I mean, I know as an EMS educator, you know, the, the worst things I can have is have a new paramedic student of mine tell me that my presentation isn't right because it doesn't say that in the textbook because the textbook's working off of four-year-old information and things have changed. So who do they believe? You know, students like black and white, they don't necessarily like gray. So I know that all of you principals meet like once a week and, and collectively as part of the Institute. So it's really easy for you to find something that needs to be changed, correct? Yeah, correct. And, you know, we, we have a list. Yeah, I mean, we constantly work off a list deciding again across our line of uh, courses and future textbooks that we're working on. Um, you know, exactly what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be changed uh, as we move forward. Uh, Peter, it, it's written in a, in a, a question answer format. So what's the advantage to that format? Well, it allows you to, one, use it as a question device so that senior paramedics can talk to, ask questions to junior paramedics. It allows for someone to read it, uh, as I mentioned before, and formulate an answer and see if their level of knowledge matches what we are you know, saying in the book. Um, and the other reason is it's different. Uh, unlike every other textbook out there, you sit there and you essentially are didactically fed information. And we wanted to make it fun. We wanted to make it easy to read um, and not just the endless page after page after page of text. Well, my good friend, Alan Brunacini used to write little notes and put them in his pocket. And then he put a book together that is all of his little pearls. And whenever I have time, I just take it. And I, every time I thumb through it, I find something that just makes me smile, makes me laugh. And uh, I was, I was coming through the other one, uh, I guess. when should I have changed? And that goes into the whole area of pulse oximetry. And I can remember years ago when pulse oximetry was not really in fashion. In fact, a year ago or, or more, uh, a lot of ambulances weren't even carrying thermometers. And COVID really changed that. And I was a, a, a zealot for people taking temperatures. And everybody said, no, there's not a reliable thermometer. And well, you go to CVS and you'll find a reliable thermometer now. So, you know. Uh, 102 is 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 a fever as far as I'm concerned, and it, it can be a bad thermometer. So, um, Peter, you you spent your your life thinking about this stuff. What's what's the favorite part of this book? What what's the favorite topic? Uh, well, for me, as an emergency physician, having spent most of my career at a level one trauma center, much like Lance. Um, I'd have to go with the ones he already mentioned, disaster medicine, the uh, weapons of mass destruction chapters. Um, and I think you pointed out the history chapter. I think it is so crucial that we don't lose our history as all of us age and leave our practices. Um, it's, it's essential that that be retained. And I think that's probably one of my favorite chapters. And you know, one of the things I just wish he was around, Jim Page would probably say is that there's no BS in this book. 
And uh, he always used to guide me as, as my mentor that he didn't want anything in gems that was that you could find somewhere. He wanted something new and unique. And so this even in here talks about what medical command is. And some people don't even understand what medical command is because their system just lets them operate on, on standing orders. But with COVID and other things now, there's a, a new system out. And uh, it's, it's uh, an article that we have up on GEMS uh, that is going to be telemedicine through board certified EMS physicians anywhere in the country. And so you could get treat and release and they've actually figured out a way to pay for it. That's the amazing thing. It's called tele 911. And those are the kind of things that I think you know, when, you, when you pick up this book and you start to go through it, is it possible to become a secondary victim from a nerve agent? Uh, incident, and 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 you tell people just enough information to keep them alive. Uh, first thing is, you know, you better be smart. You get out of your. Is it possible? Yeah, you get out of your vehicle, and you, you can be dead. So I mean, everything from managing a, a small MCI to preparing for uh, um, different areas. I mean, if you're asking me to tell the patient, I go right to the mouth. Actually, there's there's so many areas. Like, what size tube should I use? That's so important for medics to just kind of have that in, 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 in mind. And, and there's all kinds of uh, the, the chapter on airway management, what medications and airway management, uh, pain management. You know, it's back here near the end uh, at, at chapter 85, but it's critically important. There's states now that are thinking of, well, there's legislation being posed in South Carolina, free hospital fentanyl just because of the hoopla that's been going over. So a book like this maybe could explain to somebody how to, how to present that, you know, fentanyl if used in the proper way could be an important drug, you know? So what about you, Mike? What, uh, what, do, what do you think uh, from, from the reaction of people who've read it? What do you think people really like about the book? So I haven't, everyone that I've talked to that's read it, I mean, has enjoyed it. They have a lot of the same thoughts you do. I think it's the uh, brevity of the chapters where it's not super, super deep, but it's the information you need. Um, I think also that, you know, one of the, the joys of doing this is when we talk to the contributors, uh, we found people that we knew that knew that we knew that they had the right knowledge and had a passion for what they wrote about. And you, you talked about two of my favorite chapters. Um, as a guy who's been around for a while, that stress chapter is, is huge. And being able to prolong a career and how do we talk to the young guys when they come in? And the person that wrote that, he just had such a passion for peer support and stress. And, um, you know, the other one you talked about was that airway chapter. And it was uh, one of the physicians that I had worked with that wrote that. And he was just like our mentor for airways here forever. And, uh, you know, had a real good grasp on RSI, or we call it medicated enhanced intubation here in Massachusetts. And just a real down to earth approach that kind of followed Dr. McSwain's theory on airway is a verb, never a noun. So, I mean, that was just really kind of cool. And, I, and people just seem to like that. It's just like, it's, it's real knowledge that you can use and not have to go through a lot to get to it. Well, and I think a couple of things. Um, I'm not a millennial. I'm, I'm probably five times a millennial. But <laughs> um, the, the reality is the era of the big, thick textbook and, and big, meaty chapters uh, with the attention span that people have is, is probably gone. Uh, we know that in conferences, we know it in, in the magazine business. Um, but uh, I, I don't want people to think, because we're really talking about the meaty trauma things in here, that there's not a lot of other meat on the medical side. There's community paramedicine, there's uh, acute neurologic emergencies, CVA, TIA, HA. You know, I was the victim of, a, of an occluded vertebral artery. And I never even knew that I had a vertebral artery. I didn't, nobody taught me that. And then all of a sudden, I wrote an article about, you know, having stroke symptoms and ending up being the stroke protocol and self-healing. And, and I hear from the head of the emergency section of uh, Stryker Physio, and she says, I've had two of them. And nobody can explain how, how I got them or why I got them. But I was like, holy cow, we got to make sure the paramedics understand that you can have a stroke that isn't necessarily a stroke. It's like somebody pinched off my vertebral artery. And I started looking up in all my textbooks, vertebral artery, and, and I couldn't find it because apparently nobody thought that that was important. 
way back when, you know, when my emergency care industry book was really thin. The, so, uh, the, the vertebral arteries are the Rodney Danger field of arteries. They get no respect. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Well, they do for me now. I, yeah. <laughs> I I stopped going to a chiropractor because I think that's where I got my occlusion. So um, I, I don't let them touch my neck. Although I'm not, I'm not making a shot at chiropractic medicine. It was one particular chiropractor that worked on me one particular day that I thought was too rough, and I and I and I still think that that's what did it. The rest of the people in the practice, they could touch me any day of the week. So it really is important <laughs> that you understand that. But acute coronary syndromes, altered mental status. Boy, I read that chapter and, and that became one of my favorite ones because you know half of the partners that I ever worked with had an altered mental status. I just wanted <laughs> to figure out, you know, why that happened. Uh, well, uh, you, you've been doing this a long time. What's what's your favorite part of the book? I'm sorry, who well, you oh I you know what? My favorite part of the book is um, the way it's packaged. Because as, as we mentioned, the, the question format. Um, we you mentioned short attention span. You mentioned trying to find all the information in one place. And the other thing is, we've been for a long time. We've been writing together, and when a lot of people weren't using references, we were using references. And I think what that does, particularly in these days, uh, it's not true just because you say it is. Um, and I think it's important that when we say something in our materials, we reference it and the references are right there at the end of each chapter. So uh, we don't have a lot of room to tell you a lot about it, but here, this is where we got what's here and you can go deeper. And I think particularly when you're trying to induce, induce, not induce, uh, introduce um, <laughs> people to the idea that research is accessible and we try to make it more accessible through our reviews. This book is put together so that when we present these things, we back it up with where we got the information from and where you might learn more. And to me, I think that's that's an important thing about how you structure a book and uh, it makes it fun to me. Well, and, and I, like all of you, do a lot of lectures, do a lot of conferences, and I have my favorite topics and people say, oh, would you come and do your chest injuries? Because I put a lot of jazzy stuff in it. But, um, you know, with all of the contributing authors and the enthusiasms in here, I would probably go to chest injuries in here to steal a couple of pearls that I've never even thought about before to jazz up my, my lecture. So I'm telling you up front that I will use the book for that. And I think every educator could do that. Happy to, happy to hear you do that with attestation, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll attribute it every time. Um, the Lance, other, Lance, the other, thing, I, the ahead, other thing I would mention is that it really is comprehensive. We focused on and touched on some chapters um, that draws each of our individual interests, but we should point out there's pediatric information here. There's stuff on tactical medicine. There's environmental emergencies here as well. Wilderness. Um, wilderness. Wilderness. There's a little bit about air medical. Um, and we've tried to include as part of the question and answer part, stuff that is, you know, sort of new and or newer and potentially controversial. Things like the use of tranexamic acid in the pre-hospital setting. Things like the use of ultrasound in the pre-hospital setting. We have a whole chapter on that. Yeah. Um, and so this gives us the opportunity uh, to put things that, you know, are sort of just beginning to be accepted uh, in the book. Well, talk a little bit about the ultrasound chapter because I know that's one of your favorites. Uh, yeah. uh, do you see more and more services adopting it? Um, I think we're gonna see more and more services adopting it. It's a unique way to non-invasively um, evaluate patients very specifically. I should point out it's not the answer to everything. Um, and when you get a positive ultrasound, it's helpful. Uh, a negative ultrasound doesn't necessarily mean much in certain situations. Right. Um, but yes, it's a, a tool that I think we're going to start seeing more and more of in the pre-hospital setting. Um, it has a clear learning curve. Um, you know, you've got to be educated in how to both perform studies and interpret the studies. Um, but it's a unique 
diagnostic device that allows for a, a greater wealth of information in the pre-hospital setting. Well, I learned everything I know from just by watching Chicago Med. They make it look so easy. It's, you know, a diagnosis in a second. But um, do you ever think that they'll come up with like a chest patch, something that can go on and then just automatically through an algorithm or AI, um, you know, help like we, like we do at 12 lead, 12 lead interpretation and alarming. Do you think we'll get to that point? My, my answer is yes, because we're already doing that with burn care. We, we have, it's in development, but there are artificial intelligent um, programs that can scan a burn wound or a patient and have a better estimate of a burn size and depth than a human being. And it can learn from itself. So, you know, it, the, the, the program will estimate burn size, burn depth. You go back and you put in what, what, what you found one or two days later when the wound fully develops and the program learns from itself and it gets better next time. And I think that same technology of artificial intelligence will eventually apply to pre-hospital care. I, I won't go so far as to say it'll be like Star Trek and Scotty with his little uh, scanner that he carries around, but it, it, it could be that good one day. And I think artificial intelligence will play a huge role in pre-hospital care maybe not for us, but for the next generation. Yeah, and I think, you know, particularly the way your book is written, even with COVID now, there's probably some things you can add in. There's a doctor that I'm gonna be talking to that has developed a, uh, uh, an oxygen face mask that allows you to give a, a, a NEB treatment without it coming out. He has all of the science that shows, and it was, it was born out of invention of, you know, out of, out of COVID. And I think there's a lot of things like that. I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm an old paramedic, and I, I, I never, I can tell you, I rarely started an IV with gloves on. The only place we carried gloves when I started out as a medic was in the uh, maternity kit. So, you know, everything has changed and technology has changed. So I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced that resuscitation and everything else are going are gonna to benefit from AI. But, you, you know, you also talk in here about wellness, uh, scene safety, infectious disease exposure. Um, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Uh, there's so many things, that, and and I, and I wish you guys would put a chapter in here as we go down uh, the road because I try and emphasize to people that what COVID has brought is one disease that is going to bring back a whole bunch of other things for us going downhill. I mean, what we're seeing is people that are going home and they're fine. I just talked to somebody that they lost the fire captain. He went home after COVID, he thought he was fine, and he threw multiple emboli and uh, was dead from emboli. Or, you know, and, and people are going to rest through this stress. I mean, maybe one of you can talk to that, but I, I think we're going to see a multitude of problems that come up. And the paramedic of today had better be sharp because one of the questions you better be asking down the road is, have you ever had COVID? And if they say yes, I think that's going to drive fear. Anybody want to take that? Totally agree with you. This is a stunning disease that has ramifications well beyond the initial infection and just the, the pulmonary difficulties that people have had. The blood clots, the memory problems, the neurologic problems, um, it, it appears that this virus attacks every single organ system that we can think of. Um, and frankly, I, I can't think of another one that we've ever encountered that acts the way this one does. Um, and you're absolutely right. The astute paramedic is going to have to know that, okay, you may have had it four months ago. These problems persist. They get worse. Um, it's, it's a disease that just boggles the mind. Yep. Well, I think another, go ahead. They, well, they also, they also think you about other issues, you know, that that's one of the things that, that we're seeing is that, you know, recovering from COVID are potentiating other, other lung in, injuries, um, you know, COPD patients, uh, patients with, you know, uh, myocardial ischemia, you know, these, you know, the COVID is actually affecting those pre-existing conditions that those patients have had. And then we found out that the new strain is, uh, is attacking children more than we thought that it was gonna do. So 
everybody used to say, well, you know, children are, are okay. Children may not be okay with the new strain. Um, Will, go ahead. You were going to talk. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, it's so interesting. Um, I mean, it's a horrible disease and um, a lot of people are suffering, but every time something happens, there's a lot of like collateral learning um, and experience and evidence that pops up. Uh, and one of the things I think that is so striking is that incidence of flu is down by over 90%. And there can be a lot of associated factors in there, but I think what it says is very simple precautions can make a big difference because everybody's being so careful that they don't want to get COVID. The flu is down 90%. Mm -hmm. Some of that is people are less active, certainly. They're not going to as many places, but it's masks and gloves and hand washing is a big piece of that. So I think it's interesting that when we're forced to, um, we can be more careful and limit the spread of disease in very basic ways. And maybe the docs might went away and maybe I were simplified it. But. I think that's very well said. I think, I think the other thing about COVID that, that scares, um, scares me a lot is that it's fatal for, for elderly patients. It's fatal for those with, with medical comorbidities, but it, it's also life altering for the young and healthy. And plenty of people come out of this and they lose their sense of taste. They lose their sense of smell. And if you think about what a lifestyle change that is for you, that you can no longer taste a steak, you can no longer taste a glass of wine and, and what that does for your day-to-day -day life. Um, so, even if you're young and healthy and you think you're, you're, you can take on the world, this virus can still be you and, and it can change your life in ways that you can't imagine. So there you're hitting me with something that I didn't know. If, if I lose my sense of taste and smell, is that gone forever? Uh, because of COVID? Will I lose that forever? It, no, nobody knows. Um, people have lost it for um, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and some of you have yet to get it back. So I think it's, it's completely random. And then that's what's scary about this too, is how random the virus can be in terms of the symptoms that it gives different people. Lance, maybe too, well, um, since we're on this topic, because Lance, uh, you know, part of his job is to manage the ICU units. And when things were as bad as they were in, in, in New Orleans, what about the really bizarre things that were happening like with um, insulin levels and I mean, or, excuse me, you know, with the diabetic type reactions and stuff that got out of control. Well, so, so one of the most challenging things that we've dealt with, this was in the, in the ICU, um, which was 100% COVID patients, was how to manage uh, hyperglycemia in, in diabetics who could not be on an insulin drip. So in order to protect the ICU nurses, they were not allowed to go into the room uh, consistently. You know, you could go in a couple times a shift, but if you have a patient on an insulin drip to manage very severe hyperglycemia, you're in that room every hour on the hour, checking glucose, adjusting the drip, and you can't do that in a COVID patient. So, you know, we're having, we had to learn how to manage severe hyperglycemia and diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis without an insulin drip. And that was something that's not in a textbook. It's not in any uh, previous protocols and, and everybody across the country had to learn things like that on the fly and uh, just to protect the healthcare providers. So there, there were a lot of different aspects of care that, that we had sort of never thought about that we had to really adapt quickly um, to uh, to make it work for the patient. Well, in the information age, how do you share that kind of stuff with your colleagues in other hospitals? It, you know, luckily with the information age, it makes, makes it quite easy. So I think that's that's one area where we're lucky now that in, in 2020 and 2021, information can spread so quickly. Whereas with the previous pandemic back in 1917, information could not spread quickly, but it's also dangerous because bad information also spreads quickly. <laughs> and so it's a double-edged sword and you've really got to double check your sources. You have to verify your data and you, you've got to know what you're talking about and, and, and really trust your sources. Well, what I liked about the book is exactly that, is that this is a trusted place where I can go for information. There are lots of footnotes. There, at the end of each chapter are sources for you to do additional reading. And you can trust that between the five of you and the 33 contributors, you've got experts from all over the, the world, for example, that, that can talk to you about things. Uh, pelvic injuries, for example. You know, I, I uh, talked to a friend who's in uh, Berlin, and he shared with me the uh, radiological images of the people from the Berlin uh, market 
truck terrorist attack, and they all had pe crushed pelvises. And 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 when I show that to people, I say, how many people here have a pelvic splint? And they don't even know what I'm talking about. They 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 don't even oh well we're not even taught that we're not told to emphasize that so that's the kind of thing that I think people have to understand that you can bleed to death from a pelvic injury yeah. maybe you want to address that Lance so that's one of the most you know I, I mentioned earlier the uh, the riding danger field of, of arterial and of, of arteries is of the uh, vertebral arteries well the the riding danger field of trauma or pelvic fractures and and you can lose one to two liters of blood in your pelvis and from a surgical standpoint. It is difficult, if not impossible, to control that bleeding. And you're operating in a deep, dark hole with blood rushing up at you. It's it's venous blood from the back wall of the pelvis, and you just cannot control it. So that's one of those injuries that gives us uh, chest pain as trauma surgeons. And, and one of the great changes in trauma surgery over the last few years is using interventional radiology and their skills to go in and manage these on a minimally invasive approach. Uh, so it's really changed change the paradigm of care, but boy, you can, you can bleed quickly uh, to death from a pelvic fracture. And uh, it's something that every pre hospital provider should keep in mind. And, and probably one of the most common things that we see this that's done incorrectly are pelvic binders put on too high. And that's one point to emphasize to the providers is that the, the greater trochanter is the superior, the highest part of your binder. And so the binder is really not a abdominal binder, it's barely a pelvic binder. And if it looks like it's placed too low, it's actually probably correct. Yeah, it doesn't so, look weird. <laughs> it, it does look weird, but but if a pelvic binder is placed correctly, the surgeon should still be able to get to the abdomen without any difficulty. And, and it's placed low for a reason. And that's really where the, the strength of the pelvis is, is down a little bit lower. So that's probably my, my take home message to the provider is, is putting that binder on. If it looks like it's too low, you've probably actually done it correctly. Yeah, well, I do right. a lot of MCI management classes, and I talk about the type of equipment I want ordered off of ambulances when they come to the treatment area for, you know, equipment stockpile. And I always mention traction splints, and they look at me like I'm crazy, you know, and I'll say, well, how many people have put a traction splint on in the last year? And I'll, sometimes I'll get no hands that go up. I was at a place in Pennsylvania, and I said, I'm going to tell you what. You can understand the principle. If you're not using a traction splint, then you don't understand the principle of what you can do for a femur fracture. And that it was probably the, one of the number one killers in World War I, which is where the, the, the half ring was developed and saved a lot of lives. And uh, I said, just that anecdotally, I said to the class, listen, I'm going to tell you what, you know, the next time you use a traction splint, let me know and I'll buy you a steak dinner. And I <laughs> swear to God, this is not a lie. That afternoon, after we left that class, there was a bad accident, and they used three traction splints, and I had to buy three dinners. So, I'm not <laughs> sure whether the patients actually had femur fractures or whether they just wanted to use the traction splints. But you know, the number of times people, uh, you know, I, I still and and I'm going to show my age here. I still believe that we'll see a version of the mass trousers come back again for tamponading. <laughs> you know, one study does not. Uh, hey, AJ, I've said the same thing for 10 years now. What's that? I've said the same thing for 10 years. Think of what mask pants do for you, okay? One, you know, we got rid of them. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> we need to have a pelvic binder. Well, didn't they bind our pelvis for us? They did. Yeah. Yeah. Weren't they a good lower leg splint for us? Yes. Couldn't they be used as a, as a, as a femoral splint? Yes. And now we're talking about uh, abdominal tourniquets and applying right. to the the abdomen, isn't that what they did? So, I mean, so basically what we need is a, you know, a, a, a mass cummerbund instead of a mass pants, maybe. But, you know, the principles of the mass pants are, are back with us again. Well, I went to an accident scene way back when cars still had the gas filler in the back near the license plate. And a woman was pumping gas and she literally told us after she survived this that she heard the clunk of the two bumpers come together. Oh, she was crushed. And, and an EMT got there and he held her in her position of comfort, which was up. So what he was doing was tamponading her crushed uh, abdominal organs and the, all the mesentery. And she had hours of surgery. Um, when we laid her flat on the board, she went as white as the computer screen and then when we pumped up the mass trouser, just as they used to say, 
the eye, the veins popped up. We put them in. She told us we were cutting her in half. She couldn't breathe. Those were all secondary things that she didn't realize were saving her life. But um, I do believe we'll have mass trousers. And if we can have the AJ version, when we're not using them as mass trousers, we could circulate cold water and put the patient in induced hypothermia. So there you go. I think there's a market for it. Um, guys, uh, you know, I, I want to close up here by saying that um, uh, a, a word of thanks from me to you as somebody who's been in the business for a long time to, to give me a book that, that I will cherish and I will uh, uh, read as late night reading. My wife, uh, who used to be an EMT, will probably be sick of me telling her different things. But, and as I find a pearl or two that maybe aren't in here, and I heard a, a woman the other day talk about um, the, the hand, uh, we did a, 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 a webcast on burns and she was from Shriners and she said they teach that you look at the size of the person's palm and use the palm method and she put a couple slides up there and it was so intuitive that I was like why did I never know this you know uh, I you know the, the front of the chest is not always you know 18 you know the rule of nines but um it's just little pearls like that and I think this book is, is it's just full of it. I, I can't thank you enough. And AJ, for if yeah. I can mention, it's not just the questions and answers. Every chapter, we have pulled out four, five, or six of the most important pearls and pitfalls, summarized them at the end um, as sort of the most important out of each chapter, um, which I think uh, is another good review point for folks who are looking at this book. Well, and I think an EMS instructor could have some fun with this in a class oh, yeah. and just go in and say, hey, I want to know the five things. Corey Slovis is famous for his five of everything. And uh, you could say, get, you know, give me five things that are important about stress management and uh, really keep people going on it. So, um, Will, where can, where can we get the book? Um, you can come and see us at the website at iphmi.com. Um, uh, you'll find different places where you can link to the book, but you'll also see uh, the courses we've been working on. We've got a trauma course. We have some first responder type materials, uh, citizen training. Uh, we have a new course in, uh, in riot response, for instance, which is kind of timely right now. Um, so if you come to the website, you can look at all the courses we've got. It'll link you to the places where you can get the book, like at Apple, um, Barnes and Noble, and uh, Amazon, where both the print and ebook versions are. Um, but I invite you to come to the website because besides gems, you can also find our literature reviews there uh, and uh, other things that we're working on. Yeah, and you know? I think that's, that's one of the things that I like about our relationship is that you guys are on top of the latest literature and uh, that's what we wanted at gems. We wanted to be able to share that and we have a common mission. So I think we have a common goal here now with the book. I really think it's uh, an exceptional way to go. Thank you. So, Gentlemen, uh, thank you again. Uh, loved having you with us. We'll, uh, we'll talk again. Lance, I'm probably going to rely on you to do an AI article for me because I'm hot to trot on that. I just think it's, uh, you know, in, in Copenhagen now, and when uh, you call into 911, AI is working in the background, and, and they actually have had cases in cardiac arrest where they, the AI can pick up agonal breathing where the dispatcher could not. And that's uh, agonal breathing in the background. So I, I think that uh, you know, there's a lot of places, Seattle's looking at it and at other places. I mean, heck, the NFL is using AI. Why, is, why isn't EMS using it? So um, we'll, we'll, we'll look for a chapter on AI in your book within a couple of months. Thank you all very much. And uh, again, uh, $14.95 for the ebook version and $24.95 uh, uh, for the printed version. I think it'd be a great gift for somebody. Um, and, you know, we're, we're all stuck inside right now uh, when we're not doing things that are, are germane to our work. And uh, uh, I think it'd be a, a great thing for you to do and take a look at, as well as checking out the, uh, the stuff that's posted on GEMS from this group, the uh, International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute. Go online, check it out. Um, information is updated all the time. Uh, again, thank you very much for being on the EMS Today show with me. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Been great. Thanks.